I was about 13 when I was permitted to hang on the perimeter of a gang that used to gather regularly on the corner of Brooklyn. It was the territory of a 16-year-old gang leader called Dice. I never knew his Christian name. Dice was a tall, lanky black kid. He took great pride in wearing a green felt fedora with an alpine brush in the hat band and held court with his homies, who back then my Uncle Roy referred to in a demeaning way as jitterbugs, near the hot dog stand on that corner. I was at an impressionable age, and I had a certain fascination with Dice. But from the moment I was allowed to observe him up close, I had the strong and definite feeling that I didn't like him. I didn't like the way he would grab his genitals when he wanted to punctuate his street-level boast or threats. I didn't like the way he pimp-rolled, walking as though one leg was shorter than the other in an attempt to put a bravado in his stride. I didn't like the way he kept a constant scowl on his face when he talked. Most of all, I didn't like the way Dice and his boys talked to the girls. They didn't use the brazen expletives that black gangs do today, but it was understood that the higher the level of disrespect Dice's boys showed toward the girls, the highest status they gained with their fellow gang members. Dice was, in short, despicable. Back then, and still today, I don't want anything to do with people who hold their genitals or scowl or who are always boasting or in the African-American vernacular fronting. To this day, I see some of Dice and every low-life gang member I run across in the newspaper or I see on the TV news. The existence of gangs is not new, nor limited to blacks. But today's black gangs, like the black trash welfare rights proponents, have grown incredibly bold and brazen. The bishops and the chaplains were the two main gangs in Brooklyn during the 1950s. One reason I wasn't one of them was because of my mother and my Aunt Merle. The other reason was because of my father. While he didn't live with us, he definitely loomed as a no-nonsense authority figure nearby in the local precinct house. It was unfeasible, even for me as a carefree adolescent, to believe that I could run with a gang and go unnoticed by him or one of the men in his law enforcement brotherhood, especially because I was named after him, Kenneth Lorenzo Hamblin. Aside from the fact that joining a gang was considered unacceptable behavior in my West Indian household, the fact that my dad was NYPD also presented the possibility that I might be marked as a snitch. I deduced that I would be in harm's way no matter which gang I might join. So, as I grew into my teens and the peer pressure escalated to affiliate, I decided to sidestep the entire issue by becoming a neutral arms dealer, supplying my own handmade zip guns to the neighborhood's rival gangs, the bishops and the chaplains. Zip guns probably are as old as the horse-drawn buggy. I don't remember how I learned about them or how I learned to make them, but for a summer or two I had a reputation for producing some of the best. I started with a block of wood, which I cut into the shape of a pistol grip. Then I got, i.e. stole, a motor car antenna, which happened to be roughly the diameter of a twenty-two caliber bullet. I cut the lower half of it to the length of the barrel, and taped it to the block of wood. Then I got a nail and filed it into a firing pin. Another piece of the antenna created a shaft so that the nail would run true to hit the rim of the bullet. I placed it so that the bullet would slip in between the shaft and the barrel, and then I loaded it for spring pressure with rubber bands. Zip guns were primitive, but just like molded steel guns, you could use them to kill somebody, something which was almost unheard of in those days. I didn't peddle my zip guns on the corner. Guys would hear that I made them and would come to me to buy them. I sold them for just a couple of bucks. Sometimes I even traded them for records. My cottage arms dealership looks pretty harmless next to the activities of today's gangs. They've replaced zip guns with high-powered automatic firearms like Berettas, Glocks, Nines, and larger caliber Smith & Wesson revolvers. They've escalated rumbles or street fights to drive by assassinations of rival gang members, which frequently result in stray bullets hitting innocents. What kind of person belongs to these groups? Here's the example of Shaid S., an 18-year-old black thug profiled in a 1994 New York Times report on juvenile crime. 
Shahid told the Times he had snatched more than 200 automobiles, robbed between 50 and 60 people, and shot at least four more. The article described his outlook on life as, quote, a blunt Darwinian philosophy. Dares eat the grass, lions eat the dares, and men kill the lions, he mused. I'm the lion. The working people is the dare. The grass is the money, and the man shooting the lions are the cops. You take one thing out, and everything else is going to get screwed up. By sanctioning some of the anomalies of today's black trash and their perverted welfare culture as possibly being on a par with mainstream American values, the door has been opened for black gangs and gangsta wannabes to elevate their common street violence to the status of guerrilla warfare for social justice. These black thugs, these street punks, and predators have been allowed, in some cases encouraged, to believe that their acts of violence against innocent people and property are merely blows for justice, blows for black liberation and black sovereignty. They envision themselves as point men, leading the fight against the unfair system of the white man. And so, organizing gangs is validated at some level. But what is never really explained away is why they strike out at their own why they shrug off the poor black babies who are killed and maimed when they're caught in the line of fire of the gangland drive-by shootings, or why they look for excuses to shoot each other on the flimsy grounds that they've been shown disrespect, or in their argo, dissed, or why they use their African-American sisters as objects of rape and abuse for gang initiations. The irony of their phony social justice crusade is that these black thugs probably have snuffed out more of their own, more black teens, more black women, more black innocent babies, than any white racist gang like the Ku Klux Klan ever dreamed of exterminating. It boils down to cold, unremitting fratricide. But these guys are not stupid. They are street smart and institutionalized to know exactly what to say to the police, to their mothers, and to the media when given an opportunity. To the police, I didn't do it. To their mothers, I didn't do it. To the media, like, yo, I'm disadvantaged and restless because there aren't any jobs or recreational centers in my community. Gangs have become the most immediate and tangible threat to American society emanating from the black trash welfare culture. In many American cities, The threat of an unprovoked gang attack has made it unsafe to use public parks, particularly to take a stroll in the evening. The gangs have taken over the streets. I got my first close encounter with those black trash hoodlums when I asked to ride with the Aurora Police Gang Unit a few years ago. Aurora is a large Denver suburb that has made national headlines for its no-nonsense crackdown on gangs. I rode with two gang officers in an unmarked vehicle. We weren't out long before we spotted and followed some young black boys in a car who appeared to be passing a marijuana cigarette from one to another. We put the bubble light on the car roof so that anyone could tell we were cops signaling for them to pull over. But the boys must have driven another six or eight blocks. When the boys finally obeyed, one of the officers retrieved a small bag of marijuana. There were four kids in the car. The driver had a license and the car wasn't stolen. So the cops decided just to contact their parents and get them out there to deal with the dope on the spot. The boys were totally disdainful. They carried an abrasive attitude, indifferent to the seriousness of their situation, as if they were being scolded by the school librarian, not detained by city police officers. It took almost an hour before another car pulled up with the mother of one of the boys inside. As she approached, I could smell alcohol on her breath. She totally ignored her son's alleged misdeed and got in the officer's face. God damn it, what you got him handcuffed for? What you people doing with him? She was completely oblivious to the officer's response, showing no concern when confronted about her boy having drugs. She never once scolded her child for breaking the law or for getting into this predicament. It hit me that these petty teenage thugs, many of whom ultimately become killers and muggers, had been institutionalized already. They had picked up the jargon of the liberal social workers and public defenders who talk about extenuating circumstances, starting with the fact that these boys are juveniles and thus 
all but immune from punishment. Then the boys hear the politically absurd argument that there are too many blacks arrested and put into jail in proportion to the population of blacks in America. Therefore, even though these kids know very well they committed a crime, that crime is simply presented as evidence of what good kids do when they are socioeconomic prisoners of racism in America. The embodiment of these black thugs surfaced in a Denver courtroom in the summer of 1994 when Steve Harrington, 23, and Shane Davis, 21, were found guilty of the murder of young Denver businessman Tom Holler and of the beastly beating of his wife, Christina. Perhaps this crime was more graphic for me because I knew the Hollers. They were good friends of my son, and I'd met them at his wedding just a couple of years before the attack. The Hollers were attacked in Denver's Capitol Hill neighborhood about 1 a.m. on a balmy July night when two men, later identified as Davis and Harrington, approached them and demanded money and their car keys. Holler was executed in front of his terrified wife after he told her to ignore the thugs in an attempt to avoid a confrontation. The killers then ordered Christina to get back in the car, where they stripped, sexually abused, and beat her so severely that the two Denver police officers who found her in the car thought she was dead. But she actually survived to identify the men who beat her and to testify against her husband's killers. During the trial, Davis and Harrington showed virtually no remorse for killing Holler. On occasion, Harrington glared at Christina and mumbled expletives in what appeared to be an effort to intimidate her from identifying him and Davis. But he failed to shake her, and although Harrington claimed to be miles away at his mother's home in Montbello, a predominantly black Denver neighborhood, making love to a woman at the time of the crime, eyewitnesses testified that they saw him pull the trigger. Davis had a similarly lame alibi, telling authorities he couldn't remember his whereabouts that night, but guessing he was, as usual, drunk. But a coin purse tied to Davis was found in the hijacked hollow car. In the end, despite the defendant's denials, the jury found Davis and Harrington guilty of premeditated murder and a variety of other felony charges. Almost as disturbing as the crime and the trial was the response from the defendant's community. The Denver Post assigned a liberal reporter named Alan Katz to get a street view of the verdict from friends of the defendants. Here are some telling excerpts from his story. In the harsh afternoon sun, four neighbors of Shane Davis, all men under 25, gathered on a front porch to commiserate over yesterday's guilty verdicts. All seemed saddened by the news that Davis and Steve Harrington were guilty of eight felony counts. Life in prison, one of the men said bitterly. They'd have got parole if they'd have shot a black dude, a fat parole, the men laughed. The judge would have let them do charity work, the men chuckled again then launched into a complicated discussion of the defendants. They talked about rage and the feeling of being unwanted in America and of feeling shut off from mainstream society. Each man had read newspaper accounts of the Tom Holler murder. Several had watched the trial on court TV. Crying widow this, crying widow that, said one, speaking of Christina Holler. Court TV was hyping her the whole time, what I can't figure out is why the dudes raped her. Why didn't they kill her? They must have wanted to get caught. They didn't use their brains. They didn't use their brains? With those words, this African-American brother sums up the only lesson those dusky predators learned from their convicted gangster brothers. In the long run, it pays to be sure that anyone who may be able to convict you is dead. In my decade and a half on the radio, I've staunchly refused to invite these black thugs to come on my show as guests so they can exploit me and my audience with their carefully honed rhetoric of oppression. It's gotten me into a couple of tight spots, including one which was captured on video by the CBS magazine program Eye to Eye in 1994. 
Correspondent Bernard Goldberg and I were being taped, walking and talking in Five Points, Denver's Black Hood, when we were confronted by some pimp-rolling thugs with a mission to get in my face on national television. Leading the pack was a local thug and small-time hustler named Michael Asbury. I'd taken special notice of him when he was mentioned as a point person in a new program called Reconstruction Incorporated, a liberal attempt to curb gangs. The idea of the program was to let the gangs police themselves in the community. I saw this, plain and simple, as turning over the community to urban terrorists. But proponents of Reconstruction saw it as giving disadvantaged kids an opportunity to hold a position of authority. Former gang members, designated as My Hood Communicators, were to patrol the streets and were issued pagers, cellular phones, and Denver Police Department radio scanners. The police balked at the scanners, expressing concern that My Hood Communicators soon would be monitoring police frequencies to warn their homies that the cops were on the way. That became the topic of an extremely critical column I wrote for the Denver Post, in which I took a long, hard look at Michael Asbury, including the several pages of his rap sheet. The column concluded that Reconstruction was another foolish liberal enterprise and that Asbury was simply a street thug. Michael Asbury soon developed a hatred for me. He called my radio show and whined that I was picking on him. I laughed him off and said he had me confused with some white liberal he thought he could bully. While doing an interview for Eye to Eye, Bernie Goldberg asked me to go down to Five Points, the center of Denver's black ghetto, to get some footage of me walking on the streets. The drum quickly sent word that Ken Hamblin was in the hood, and soon after our arrival, Asbury walked up on us, backed up by three of his little thugs, and tried to tyrannize me with the cameras running. He's selling the community out, he yelled. He downgrades this community when he's got it so lavish. Look at how he's dressed. The man's got it made. I was in a suit and tie and a top coat with my trademark fedora. Those thugs were dressed in typical gangland attire. I tried to talk to them, but it fell on deaf ears. I'm angry, I began. I'm angry that when somebody who looks like you walks up on people today, they're afraid. You perceive it as power, but you try to relate to me on a level that is going to keep you on your back. I fought to change that, brother. It was clear Asbury wanted only one thing, to punk me out, to diss me on national television. After meeting him, I was certain that, despite his ability to pull the wool over the eyes of liberal social workers, I had been right on the money when I'd pegged him early on for exactly what he was, a black thug looking to get over. In poor households like mine, the birth of a baby was somewhat less than a happy, blessed event, and for good reason. While most poor babies were loved, the overriding emotion associated with their birth was concern about having another mouth to feed. Like so many American parents, I was driven to make certain that my kids didn't repeat the desperation of my youth. I was committed to changing things for them, and I believe for the most part I've succeeded. Today, black teenage girls have no such misgivings about bringing life into the world. They breed in unspeakable numbers. If the gangs are the foot soldiers of the black trash welfare culture, then these young girls are the broodmares whose sole function is to keep replenishing the rank and file, collecting appropriate welfare entitlements for each newborn. According to Jane Deacon, a nurse at Denver General Hospital, these girls are lacking even the most basic maternal instincts. I interviewed Deacon on my Denver radio show in 1994 after she'd kept a journal the previous year while on duty in the newborn nursery at Denver City Hospital. She made the startling observation that from the time she began making entries on June 6, it was not until July 22nd that she attended a birth by a married mother. Almost all the mothers she cared for were teens, the grand majority of whom were not having their first child. Nurse Deacon had even met a 16-year-old mother who, when she was asked to fill out a form for her baby's name the day after she had given birth, had forgotten what she'd named him. She knew, however, the precise number of the form she needed to fill out to request welfare payments. 
Only rarely did the fathers appear. If any male was there, he was usually a new boyfriend.